and the peak periods. Uh, so France was clearly relying very heavily on external capacity to meet its internal demand. <coughs> there is an irony that the third package is supposed to integrate markets <coughs> and is doing so through a single auction platform, uh, but at the same time we're pursuing a policy of autarky, which is quite the other extreme. Um, so what happens? Well, if people are reluctant to rely on imports, and that ENSOE figure showed at the beginning that it suggests that each country feels a bit nervous about importing, uh, then obviously in total there's going to be more capacity than you need. Um, and that's going to suppress the price differences across borders, and that's going to make the economics of building interconnectors less attractive. So this is a self-fulfilling policy. If you p pursue autarky, you finish up with a justification for pursuing autarky. Uh, but that's an expensive and inefficient solution. <coughs> now let's look more generally at what happens if the Secretary of State, as we argued, produce, uh, procures too much. Um, so the first thing that will happen is there will be more capacity on the system, so the prices will be lower. Uh, after 2018 when this capacity is delivered. Um, and we fix the price that we pay to renewables. We have a strike price, and we pay the difference between the strike price and the market price. Now, if the market price goes down, then the amount you have to pay the renewables goes up. But the Treasury has already said there's a limited <coughs> amount of money available for renewables, so if the price goes up, we can afford less. So the Im impact of this... Um, excessive procurement of fossil plant, which is the flexible stuff, is to produce, is to uh, in, be able to afford less renewables, which is uh, what we were required to do by the uh, climate change policies. <coughs> now, the way the auction works is you bid for the amount of money that the market won't give you. Uh, but you are expected to sell in the wholesale market and the balancing market and various other markets. Uh, and so the more money you make in the market, the less money you need to subsidize your capacity. But if you drive the price down in the wholesale market, then you need more money in the capacity auction. Uh, so the um, more money, uh, the lower the wholesale price, the less you run, uh, the less money you make, the more money you need from the capacity auction. So again, uh, by procuring too much, you raise the cost of procuring it. Um, and the marginal plant sets the price for all plant, old and new, um, and that's going to be paid by consumers. Uh, and the consumers are going to, they haven't fully realized this yet, but uh, sooner or later somebody's going to point out that they're paying so much per kilowatt, and there are large numbers of kilowatts here, uh, something like um, if you take the price of 49 pounds a kilowatt, something like two and a half billion pounds, three and a half billion euros, of money is going to come on consumer bills. Um, and the government may say, oh, but the wholesale price will be lower. So actually, it isn't quite as expensive as you think. But it's always very difficult to convince consumers that things would have been different otherwise, and actually they're not as badly off as they thought they were. That's a hard political sell. Uh, so. Let's move on to what actually happened. <clears throat> well, um, the, the blue line is this downward sloping demand curve, um, and we're concentrating only on a very small part of the auction. Uh, and the point to make is that the price cleared at um, below £20 a kilowatt. So National Grid said it would have cleared at 49 if that was our estimate of the cost of new entry. There is new entry here, quite a lot of new entry. But the crucial thing is, it isn't the kind of new entry that National Grid thought. They thought large combined cycle gas turbines, which are very expensive, uh, will be required and they will need a considerable subsidy. The average size of new entry here is about 30 megawatts. These are small plants, uh, which are quite cheap to build and are useful for other purposes. And so the first lesson that comes out is, if you leave setting prices to bureaucrats, they will get it massively wrong. The auction <laughs> reveals what the bureaucrats have no idea is out there. Um, so the, the, the message is quite clear. We need auctions to reveal 
what other people that the bureaucrats don't know do know. Okay, so um, what happened? Well, our panel of technical experts published our final report, um, uh, which was highly critical of National Grid, which was advising the government on procurement. Um, and we specifically said ignored interconnectors. Um, and we said, no problem, you can leave a gap because the interconnectors are already there. So they could bid in the T minus one auction one year ahead, if necessary. And in any case, you ought to uh, reduce the demand um, because they're going to supply something anyway. Uh, so they strongly ignored that. And immediately after they'd fixed the quantity to procure, they then announced that there would be um, uh, a, a consultation on interconnector eligibility. Uh, probably Brussels was leaning on them. Um, and then they announced on the 2nd of December before the auction uh, that there would actually be interconnectors included. Uh, but in order to save their face, they said they won't be included until a year after the auction that they were going to run in a few days' time. <coughs> and they haven't yet decided what how you work out what the volume that an interconnector can contribute. So um, <coughs> that then raises the question, um, well, if there are interconnectors there, which there are, and some countries have capacity markets and some don't, um, how does this work? How do you solve the problem of efficient trading in this integrated European auction platform with countries doing different things on the capacity payment? <coughs> um, and the answer is that if you have an efficient pricing system, uh, then you can't lose. If other people choose to have an inefficient pricing system, uh, they will be ripped off by the people with the efficient pricing system. This is one of those nice cases where good design just drives out bad design. It's often the other way around. But if I think it's worth importing electricity at up to 17 pounds a kilowatt, uh, and other people think it isn't, uh, then I can import and meet my demand. Uh, and if other people are willing to subsidize me, fine. Uh, so if there were no price caps, then efficient pricing would mean that we would get um, the countries with capacity markets that were well designed would uh, get an efficient solution, and the countries which had poorly designed markets would lose. But there is a price cap. <coughs> uh, so the critical question that, as I think, still has to be resolved, and which I think is an interesting research project for academics, is when the auction reaches the price cap and you then have to allocate by some other means, what is the means by which it should be allocated? Um, and we would hope it would be efficiently allocated. And if we uh, are going to rely on interconnectors to provide some of the security of supply, then we need to know exactly how that problem is going to be solved. If the market clears at less than 3,000 euros, there's no problem because we think it's worth more than that when we're scarce. But it, if it really is scarce, then it's going to hit the price cap. And at that point, we need to know what happens. Uh, and that really comes down to the system operators agreeing essentially what happens when the market isn't working. In other words, what are the emergency actions that are available? <clears throat> so um, let's assess where we are. The case for the interconnectors is that we have an unstable policy environment, and we also have non-commercial low carbon investment. So the market isn't deciding how much capacity comes on the system. Politicians are, and they're notoriously untrustworthy. <coughs> The capacity markets can reduce the investment risk. Um, they can guarantee the fixed capital cost element, or some part of it. Um, the auction design in GB, I think um, the way it works and the outcome uh, confirms that it was way better than regulators or politicians deciding what the price should be. <clears throat> um, the only problem is that it's nervous politicians who don't want to be held up and said, you caused the lights to go out. That's what loss of load suggests. Uh, they, they, they err on the side of caution. <coughs> um, the result 
is that I think we've procured too much, um, and that's been driven by this misperception about what a loss of load actually means, um, and also because of our mistrust of foreigners, which seems to be pervasive. Each country wants to rely on its own resources. <coughs> um, and so now we're forced to include them. We have to decide how we're going to do it. Uh, so we have some challenging I think quite theoretically interesting problems to resolve in order to move on to the next step of how do we actually integrate markets, especially markets which are not the same on each side of the interconnectors. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Newbery. Uh, now the floor could ask, can ask questions to Professor Newbery. Professor Mo Monica Juliet, please. Here, uh, SARS. SARS. Um, you mentioned the big costs associated with this policy and um, the fact that consumers are basically going to be hit by uh, this uh, um, type of uh, effect of the policy decisions. Uh, do you think that there will be a way of uh, unraveling the problem a few years down the line when these costs become um, included in energy bills and um, the public might decide that they're not politically acceptable? Well, um, the good news is the price in the auction was much lower than expected. So the forecasts were a cost of two and a half billion pounds, and now it's about 900 million pounds, so it's much less. Nevertheless, um, it, it looks like a bad deal. But what the um, government has always been saying is don't look at the price, look at the bill. So um, if the wholesale price is lower and the capacity payment is higher, maybe the bill, uh, the annual cost of the electricity, won't be quite as high. Uh, and of course, uh, the good news is the price of gas is coming down. The bad news is that the amount and therefore the cost of renewables is going up. Uh, so what the bill will actually be in a few years' time we don't know. We do know that the Labour Party has a manifesto pledge to freeze the price of electricity, uh, and that turns out to be a hugely popular move. So I don't need to stress that uh, once you politicise setting the price to the consumers in a country, that way lies ruin, but um, <laughs> we will see. Uh, so there is no way that energy prices for consumers is not going to remain a highly political issue. Uh, and the more politicians are involved in setting that, I think the more political it, it uh, will be. Uh, so we will wait. Now, the big advantage for the Secretary of State is that he doesn't get criticised for not taking action now, but he isn't going to be the Secretary of State when the bill comes home to roost in four years' time. Thank you. Uh, Professor Pereira Silva. Uh, Valeria Di Cosmo Valeria from the ESI Cosmo. in Dublin. Um, when you were talking about uh, forward markets as a signal for investment in capacity, you were assuming that self-dispatch is available in the day ahead, or you think that even if you don't have self-dispatch, forward market itself can be a sort of um, signal to invest in capacity? Well, you raise a very good point. So if you think of oil forward markets, uh, that's very simple because uh, you can store oil. So a price at some future date is a price essentially for a period over which you can store. Uh, but a forward price of electricity, the price changes every half hour. Uh, so in practice, a forward price is for either base load or peak load for a quarter or a year. <coughs> and you have to predict what is relevant for your kind of plant? How many hours is it going to run? Is it just going to run in peak hours or is it going to be a baseload producer, in which case a baseload contract makes sense? 
Uh, so you're perfectly correct to cast some doubts about exactly what the forward price is for and how that helps making the investment decision. But in any case, the forward market only goes in any liquidity a couple of years ahead. So it, and since it takes more than a couple of years to build a power plant, that isn't very helpful. Some other questions? Yes. Uh, Mr. Pedro Mejia, who is the president uh, of the yes, Power Market. It's a, a, very, a very simple question. First of all, just to congratulate you for an excellent and brilliant presentation. My question is very simple. What do you think about negative prices? Um, well, there are good negative prices and bad negative prices. So a good negative price, you can find this in the Australian market, if you've got a lignite power station <coughs> and um, the option is do you switch it off and spend eight hours bringing it back on, the answer is it might be better to accept a negative price <coughs> to remain on the system because it's cheaper to do that than to incur the startup costs. A bad negative price is if a renewable generator can only get its subsidy by generating electricity. Uh, and that's because we pay the subsidy per megawatt hour rather than per megawatt <coughs> of available capacity. Uh, and I think the European Union is rather anxious to prevent renewables driving prices negative because they can disconnect and reconnect at no cost. A large coal-fired power station cannot disconnect and reconnect at no cost. Some other questions? Please, uh, Juan Rosellón, Professor Rosellón. Uh, just a question, uh, if you could elaborate a little bit more about um, the issue of interconnectors. I, I would think myself as an outsider looking at the markets in, in Europe um, that this is uh, more a, a political problem uh, that um, hinders the construction of, of interconnectors. But I would like to see if you could elaborate a little bit more about the, the measures that have been, are being taken to uh, carry out these market couplings. Uh, are they going in the right direction or not? Well, <coughs> uh, you ask a very deep question because uh, I sit on the Single Electricity Market Committee of the island of Ireland, uh, which has to adapt its market design to the target electricity model. 